When she first moved to New York, she was living in, in Tribeca. But then by 1974, she had moved to Grand Street in Soho. So she's sourcing the things that are available in an area that is transforming from being a fairly industrial, non-residential one to being one that is populated by artists. And so in that process, she's, she's willing to use plastics, she used pig iron, metals of different kind, but she was also very interested in, in paper. So much of her work is also ephemeral. This episode of Clever is brought to you by COS. Hi everyone, I'm Amy. I'm Jamie, and this is Clever. We've got something special for you in this episode. We're talking to Karen Gustafsson, who's creative director of London-based fashion brand Cause, and Courtney J. Martin, deputy director and chief curator of Dia Art Foundation. Courtney is curating a long-term exhibition of the work of artist Dorothea Rockburn, and Cause is supporting this exhibition. And we thought it would be super interesting to sit down with them, discuss the exhibition and their collaboration from both of their perspectives. My name is Courtney J. Martin, and I live in Manhattan, New York, and I am the Deputy Director and Chief Curator of the DIA Art Foundation. I work at DIA because it is a collection that I feel passionately about. I am an art historian, and DIA offers me the opportunity to work with objects that I studied as a scholar and wrote about, but I get to, to see them every day. My name is Karin Gustafsson. And I live in London. I am the creative director for COS. So I work with all the creatives at COS and I'm responsible for the visual look of the brand. I work in fashion and for COS because I always loved making things and I love making collections. I really enjoy working on setting the directions uh, that are influenced by art and design and that in the end are the influence for us as a brand every season. Courtney, we understand that you have been working to mount a long-term exhibition of the work of Dorothea Rockburn at Dia Beacon. Yes. And we understand that COS is supporting that exhibition. I wonder if you can start by helping us get oriented to Dorothea Rockburn and her work. I can. Dorothea is an artist that I started studying when I was an undergraduate. She is, if not the first, she's one of the first women to appear on the cover of Art Forum, where she appeared in March of 1972. Dorothea is a native of Canada. She's from Montreal, and she comes from an English family inside of a French-speaking city. So she is fascinating in terms of the influences on her early life. One of them was having had parents who encouraged her to study dance and also to study the making of art. In the early 50s, she went to Black Mountain College in North Carolina, which was an experimental school modeled on the Bauhaus, meaning that all forms of art making were equal. Um, So there were no hierarchies among the medium. So painting and sculpture, for example, were not more important than any other art making. There she studied dance and painting, of course, but she also studied mathematics with the math scholar Max Dane. After she left Black Mountain in the 50s, she'd made so many friends there, people like Robert Rauschenberg, Cage, Merce Cunningham, really important avant-garde figures in, in the 50s in New York. And with that knowledge and with those relationships, she moved to New York. And so she was resettled in New York by the late 1950s. What a cool time to be an artist. (laughs) Whenever I read about artists who were working or even just starting out during that time period in New York City, it's just so exciting. It seems like so much was going on. So thank you for giving us some background on her. Can you talk a little bit more about the themes and the techniques or materials that are involved in her work? Sure. Even though Dorothea had been trained as a dancer and a painter, I think she begins almost immediately once arriving in in New York from Black Mountain to experiment with both. Her paintings move from being one to two dimensional works on the wall to being works that were on the floor, 
across installation space is really becoming immersive experiences. And largely, she credits having been a a performer as a part of the Judson Dance Company and also with other performers like Carolee Schneeman as really opening up her body to making painting that was not just confined to two-dimensional wall-based painting. The other heavy influence, of course, in her painting is that of high math, as she calls it. So really advanced understandings of mathematical concepts. So things like variables, domains, set theory, which is essentially that objects can be part of a set, but they can also be seen distinctly, which come out of mathematics, she uses as visual codes or or what she calls visual equations to be able to make installations that involve many materials that one would not necessarily describe as paint, but she is, as she feels, painting with them. Oh, interesting. What would those materials be? In the late 60s and early 70s, those materials were things like crude oil, linseed, greases of different varieties, items that she describes as being household because they could be bought at the hardware store, they could be sourced from from anywhere in her neighborhood at the time. When she first moved to New York, she was living in, in Tribeca, but then by 1974, she had moved to Grand Street in Soho. So she's sourcing the things that are available in an area that is transforming from being a fairly industrial non-residential one to being one that is populated by artists. And so in that process, she's she's willing to use plastics, she used pig iron, metals of different kind, but she was also very interested in, in paper. So much of her work is also ephemeral. Was there a conceptual reasoning for using materials that would have been considered industrial or non-precious in her work? I think yes, and I think that Part of it has to do with her understanding of math and the variability of math that is is so deeply connected to nature, the kind of one-to-one match between what we see as numerical variation in nature can also be found in the urban world. And I think she's, she's playing around with that idea. I also think that it's also what's available and sort of this is something that I think carries over from her training at Black Mountain is what do you have that's sitting next to you that you can use and then how might you exploit that material to its greatest ends? Well, it also sounds like, and I could be making an assumption here, but it also sounds like that lack of hierarchy at Black Mountain may have translated over to her choices of materials as well on purpose, very deliberately. Absolutely. So Karen... What was your introduction to Dorothea Rockburn and why are you so enamored of her work? I was in New York 2013 together with my team. We were here to do research and we went to MoMA and we came across her work. There was an exhibition with her then. I haven't heard about her before, but really sort of fell in love with her work straight away. And I really like the simplicity and the interesting use of material and the surfaces and the lines and the shapes. So yeah, we got a book and we brought it back to London and that book has been in our bookshelves ever since. And every now and again, we bring her work up. And when we started to work on Spring Summer that is in store now, we saw different artists that sort of worked with paper as a media. And therefore we felt, again, let's put Dorothea's work on our mood board. Isn't it sort of magical the way art can reach inside and touch you in that way? And I understand that you have looked to Rockburn to inspire this collection. Yeah. You know, putting it up on the mood board is one thing, but can you break down the creative process for us for how specifically her work might inspire the collection or some pieces in it? For us, we're not literal when we look at inspiration. It's more a feeling or approach or a work method from an artist that makes us think and inspires us to use a certain technique in our work process. And for this spring-summer collection, we worked a lot with paper folding to create the starting point of the silhouettes. And then also we worked with materials such as cotton and gave them different surfaces and hand fills to give them sort of a more papery feel because we really liked the idea of creating a collection that had a relationship and a reference towards paper. For example, you can find a menswear shirt that is cut almost as a sheet of paper. It's a square. Mm. 
and also we have pieces like tunics that are cut with fold lines and trousers that have a collaged hem, for example. So it's interesting. It sounds like the tactile qualities of Dorothea Rockburn's work is one of the things that you are responding to and translating, not literally, but that's one of the things that I really enjoy about, well, inspiration. It can go in one filter and come out in another form (laughs) and completely differently, but it's influenced you on the inside somehow. Yeah, that's <laughs> definitely true. If you don't have inspiration, you don't evolve. The inspiration helps us to evolve and think differently. Does it also help you collaborate with your team? Is it a visual language that you can all start to speak and dissect and refer to? Of course, everything is about teamwork. So from creating the directions and the concepts and when we then later on translate them into product... It's many hands that works with these products before we launch them to the customer in the store. For example, the designers work very closely with the pattern cutters. And we have an atelier where we create swatches of material surfaces and draping and folding. So in general, COS has a history with looking at art and design for inspiration and then honoring that inspiration by supporting exhibitions, artists, and creative endeavors across the globe. We've covered some of those on Design Milk. I've long been a fan of your supporting of the arts. And it sounds like a mutually nourishing process. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So for us, the starting point is always art and design. And we always start off from scratch every season by doing a lot of research and When we do these collaborations, it's a way, of course, to give back to the world where we get so much inspiration from. But we also see that our audience, our customer, also has this interest and shares this interest with us. So it's a way for us to sort of put inspiration and product in a close context. And also, it's a way to sort of underline a vision Mm -hmm. that has inspired us. We have done collaborations in the past For example, we have been part of Salone de Moble, which is a design fair originally in Milan that takes place in April every year. And we've had the opportunity to work with different creatives from different disciplines. And what we like to do is to give the artist a blank canvas. The only thing we ask them to consider is our DNA, because we're not artists or architects, but we just really sort of like to have another creative creating a piece but with cost in mind when I look back at the pieces so for example we worked with Mm -hmm. Su Fugumoto the architect we worked with Studio Swine last year and this year we worked with uh, Philip K. Smith III who is an American artist and they all have a synergy all the pieces have something in common And it's obviously a moment for us to celebrate someone else's vision, but also the audience who comes to these events is our customer. So it's a way for us to also meet the customer in another setting. Courtney, from a curatorial perspective, what's involved in mounting an exhibition like this one with Dorothea Rockburn? And and also, can you tell us, is she making new works for this exhibition? Would you consider it a retrospective or... Give our listeners a little bit of an overview of the exhibition. So this is a funny question for us because this exhibition is in fact like few others that we will work on or that most people will work on in their lives. The majority of the work was shown between 1967 and 1972. After each installation in the early life of that work, the de-installation rendered it non-showable after that which meant that when we approached Dorothea to begin planning this exhibition, we also approached her to discuss how we would remake these objects. And so we have spent about 12 weeks with Dorothea this year and about half a month in 2017 doing tests, researching materials, making models, going through an extensive period of fact gathering and testing and trying out new things before we got to the point at which we could actually make the objects again and install them. Generally speaking, one would have objects that would then be 
perhaps conserved or evaluated in some way. Research would happen around the history of those objects. And, you know, of course, we would also interact significantly with an artist. We've done those things with Dorothy as well. But on top of that, she has been staying in Beacon, where the museum part of our institution is located, spending many days there for the last 12 weeks working on this exhibition, making sure that everything that she had made, in some cases nearly 50 years ago, could be remade again and shown. So I have to say that this is what has made this exhibition such a privilege to work on because it is, I think for most of us involved, our director, Jessica Morgan, our exhibition designer, Heidi Giannotti, and myself, we have learned how she made the work to begin with. It is as if we are back in 1967, back in 1970, actually making that work with her from her original ideas, from her notes, and working with her to figure out how we could do that again. This is, I know, to be one uh, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for all of us. Oh my gosh, that's so amazing. I have goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, every day. <laughs> so, I, I mean, obviously, we're you're spending all of this energy and working with her so closely to remake the work, it will not be rendered unshowable on deinstall this time, right? Some of the work is actually temporal and ephemeral. Many of the pieces that Karen was inspired by in at the MoMA show in, in 2013, more permanent works. We also have in our exhibition works that are related that are also made from folded and manipulated paper, rolled paper, paper that is basically moved around in all kinds of ways. But as we also know, paper is fragile. Yeah. So it is very likely that we will work with Dorothea after this work is deinstalled to remake it again for the next time that we install it, or if it is shown somewhere else. The most exciting aspect, though, of being a part of the Dia Art Foundation is that our exhibitions are on long-term view in Beacon. So we will be showing Dorothea's work at a minimum for the next three years, continuously. That is amazing because that means uh, that means I'll get to see it in person. <laughs> yes, maybe, maybe not even once, but twice. Yeah. I actually have a question about the nature of her work from a conceptual standpoint and how you've been able to communicate that to people who come to view the exhibition. Because you talked a lot about mathematics and like very complicated concepts in mathematics. And if someone doesn't have that kind of background, how are you able to present her work in a way that it can be consumed, viewed and appreciated by a large population of people? You know, I am not a mathematics scholar, and I have to say that I have read a lot about the concepts that Dorothy is working with. We all have it, Dia. But I don't think that one has to have some great body of knowledge in which to approach the work. I knew the work before, you know, I began looking at the concepts behind it, and I think that it was just as interesting, enjoyable, aesthetically rich as it is now. I just have a new dimension. I think actually this opens up a real opportunity for us. In Beacon, we have an extensive education program in the Beacon City Schools. And so we see students in the second grade, the seventh grade, and then again in high school. And then we also have an additional program in which we see teens from the Hudson Valley. And one of the things that I am looking forward to and that, that I've discussed extensively with our education department is that not only will we have a kind of lesson around making or creating, but we can also have a lesson about mathematics, which, you know, for anyone in the second or seventh grades, we know that those are really important skills to develop, but not just to develop, to really understand fully. I will say that if anyone had try to explain some of the concepts that Dorothy is working with that come out of both calculus and algebra to me at that age by using the visual equations, as she calls them, I think it actually might have been a lot easier to understand. Oh, I think it would have helped me a lot. Yeah. I, I Math didn't come naturally for me, but when when I could actually manipulate something in three dimensions or uh, on a more complex level, if I could see it visually represented, it clicked. It made a lot more sense to me, but I also saw the beauty in it and it started to 
I started to see how it was representative of nature and it seemed less abstract. Absolutely. I think that, that Dorothea's work gives us all that opportunity, but I also think that one of the things that she's talked about extensively is that working through these concepts in a visual form have also allowed her to explore things that she was learning at the same time. Uh, and so it's a, it's a temporal, I want to say, record of her intellectual growth. Absolutely. Oh, I love art. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. <laughs> yeah, I want to know how this partnership came about. So how did you, how did Dia and Koss kind of come together and decide this was really what we want to do and let's do this together? Obviously, we have been aware of Dia for a long time and we really like their exhibitions and the artists they feature. And one of the members in the costume met Courtney and started the conversation. And yeah, I think for us it felt really natural because obviously a lot of the artists that you exhibit or that Dia exhibit are also artists that we keep on coming back to. Karen is absolutely right. We, a fellow curator and I, literally ran into a member of the cost team outside the Luis Barragon house in Mexico City oh. and began a conversation, which I think standing in front of great architecture is, is really easy to do. Yes. And we had all kinds of interesting things to say about the architecture, about all of the art that we had seen that day in Mexico City. And then it sort of took off from there. I knew that Cost had previously been interested in art and exhibitions a few years ago, they supported a Bauhaus exhibition at the Barbican in London that I had seen. And I just thought that that overlap between art and design is so fruitful. I'm so happy to know when we found out that Karen had seen Dorothea's exhibition at MoMA and that had been inspired by it, that was that sort of sealed, I think, our ability to work together because we were quite literally speaking the same language. I was actually quite pleased to hear Karen use terms that Dorothea has used herself. Dorothea talks about her materials being simple. And she means that in the sense that they are available and accessible and readily handy for people, that they are not strange or abstract or weird in any way. Or exotic. No, not at all. Yeah, I love how just using language like that could really change someone's perspective of whether or not they could be an artist or a designer. Because you don't need to go and buy lots of expensive materials or you'd, sometimes you don't need four years of school. You know, just going out and making do and making something out of what you have access to, beautiful things can come from that. And you can also gain inspiration, as Dorothea has, from everything that you were exposed to. You know, it wasn't just a training in painting that gave her the ability to make this work. It was the training in dance. It was her really seeking an understanding of math. But so much of that happened for her as an adult who spent time reading and learning and seeking out this information. So, you know, it really, it offers us all an opportunity. It does. It's the seeking of information and then it's giving yourself the permission to express all of this in your own way and taking the time and energy to, to hone certain aspects of your expression so that you can keep pushing it forward. And there's an accessibility, like you said, and an approachability to these materials that you might call simple that doesn't exclude anyone. And it almost instantly touches someone who can relate because these materials are something that trigger a familiarity in them right off the bat. Absolutely. I'd like to ask you, Courtney, why do you feel these supportive relationships between brands and art foundations are important? I think that one of the most interesting things that could come from this is that someone who is going to a cost store anywhere in the world could learn about an artist while they're doing something that might seem to them disconnected from art viewing. And so maybe that person has never been to a museum before. Maybe they have, you know, not felt that museums offer them anything, or maybe they don't live in a city in which there is a museum. And so perhaps that allows someone to have a different frame of mind about what belongs in the museum, including their own bodies. And so I think that it is really important that as museum institutions that we figure out new and different ways to reach audiences and let them know that not only is everyone welcome, but there are many things happening here 
inside of our institutions that might be interesting to you, no matter where you come from or what walk of life you're involved in. Art really is for everyone. That's beautiful. (laughs) I know. I love it. I'm very excited for this exhibition and I love hearing you discuss your process and, and how this art that was created 50 years ago is being recreated and will live on again. And this amazing artist, Dorothea Rockburn, is still touching people. It's so incredible. Thank you so much for sharing everything with us. Thank you for having us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Well, I want to say that I just love that COS is so supportive of art and would go to the length of supporting an exhibition based on the fact that they were inspired by a specific artist and their work just for a collection. I love the circular nature of the whole thing where they draw inspiration from art. Mm -hmm. They use it in their collection to design new pieces and then they give back by honoring that inspiration. I think that by working together through such a great collaboration that they're able to communicate the ideals and concepts of an artist in a more accessible way and reach more people in that way. But also what I really loved about this was it was a collaboration between Dia and Dorothea Rockburn. I mean, to work with an artist to recreate pieces that were done in the 50s and 60s, just to show them again is incredible. I mean, the goosebumps just came back. Yes. And you could tell that Courtney was so so thrilled that she got the opportunity to work so close with Dorothea. And there's something kind of magical when you go back and revisit your a body of work from a long time ago and and recreate it and re-investigate those ideas. I haven't seen her work in person, but they discuss the tactile nature of it. And I just got so excited. And I'm excited to feel those pieces that Karin was talking about too, with the papery texture. Mm-hmm. I don't understand the complex mathematics that Dorothea was inspired by, but I do understand taking something like that and translating it into a visual expression. And so I'm really excited to see how she's done this. And I appreciate that Cause is is also so committed to translating that into something you can wear every day. The Dorothea Rockburn installation will be on view at Dia Beacon from May 2018 for the next three to five years. So to keep up with it, follow Dia Art Foundation and Cost Stores on Instagram. You can also watch a short film about the show featuring Dorothea Rockburn at coststores.com. Thank you for listening, everyone. Please go to cleverpodcast.com to sign up for our newsletter, read the show notes, and see images from the exhibition and pieces from the Cost Collection that were inspired by Dorothea's work. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Clever Podcast. We love to hear what you have to say. This episode of Clever was edited by Ty Navaris and Alex Perez with music by L1011. 